thank you all for attending our first virtual candidates debate for the 17th District Senate race with Senator George Logan and George Cabrera. Thank you, candidates, for participating, and we look forward to hearing from you on the many topics, especially in this really challenging year that we're all facing. So thank you for being here. Um, I'd like to thank Joe McDonough, Chair, um, Chamber Board Member and Chair of our Governmental Affairs Committee, along with the Hampton, North Haven League of Women Voters, for their help in organizing the event this evening. Thank you also to Nathan Ryan, owner of The Playwright, um, for hosting us tonight and for all the work that he did to make this event possible. Um, so we're very, very appreciative of his support. And also to Jeff from the Irish Culture and Sports Association for providing the audio equipment um, for us this evening. We couldn't have done it with his help um, to make sure that our Facebook Live event goes well with all the appropriate audio. Um, we have a lot of questions, so I want to be able to get started. Um, but I'd like for the people that are watching us this evening, um, please know that, um, again, we are live and we are taking questions. So those that are home watching us, if you have a question for the candidates, if time permits, please put that in the comment screen right on the Chamber's Facebook page. We have monitors that are watching the questions, and if time permits, we'll make sure that those questions get answered. So please make sure you comment on the Facebook page. Um, so again, I want to be able to get started. We have a lot of questions for this evening. I'd like to introduce you to our moderator, Stephen Chardella. Um, Stephen has been a practicing attorney since 1983 in Hampton and founded the general practice law firm, which bears his name and is located at 2840 um, Whitby Avenue in the Mount Carmel section of Hampton. Steve's law firm specializes in residential and commercial real estate transactions, business transactions, and litigation. He's also a principal in the Eli's Restaurant Group, which operates many restaurants here in Hampton, are all our favorites um, in Hampton, Brantford, Orange, Milford, and the new one in Manchester. Um, Steve has been a moderator of, chamber, of our Chamber of Commerce debates for over 25 years. Um, he has been a, a strong supporter of the Chamber and has been a Chamber member since 1986. So we are appreciating his time and dedication to us and to our Chamber, um, and we look forward to having a very spirited debate. And I'd like to introduce you to Steve Chardella. Thank you, Nancy. It's nice to be back. I uh, appreciate the opportunity and uh, to be here tonight with everyone. Before we start, just like to go over some ground rules uh, that were established for tonight's debate. A coin toss has determined the order in which each candidate will make their opening statement. The candidate who speaks first will also be the first to make a closing statement and will also be the first to answer the first question. The candidate to speak first will be Mr. Logan. Each candidate will have 90 seconds for an opening statement, 90 seconds for a closing statement, and 90 seconds to answer each question. A timer will monitor these time periods and hold up the side to indicate to the candidate when the candidate has 30 seconds remaining. A stop sign will be raised when the time has expired, at which time the speaker must finish their response within the next 10 seconds. After each candidate has answered the question, they may take an additional 30 seconds to respond to the question again. A stop sign will be held up when the 30 seconds has expired. So, get underway. We have an opening statement first from Mr. Logan. Thank you. I want to thank the uh, League of Women Voters and the Hampton Chamber of Commerce for putting together this event. This has been a year like no other, and it has been a campaign like no other. You know, the current pandemic has changed all our lives in extraordinary ways. One of those main casualties is the legislative uh, session, which abruptly came to an end in March of this year. Uh, but I continue to put out my vision for Connecticut, which is one of affordability for the people of our state, all that live in our state. We need to set that up with an environment that attracts businesses to stay here in Connecticut and to expand their workforces. We need more people working. We can achieve affordable health care that is accessible to everyone. And as a member of the Griffin Hospital Board of Directors, I understand the importance of preventative care and accessibility of health care for all of our uh, uh, folks here living in our district in the 17th district. Um, it is important that we continue and have deliberate focus on that. Uh, properly uh, funded education. I want to freeze tuition at state colleges so once you enter college, you know what you're going to pay as you go through college. 
also support vocational programs and vocational technical uh, schools as well. Uh, I think it's important that we embrace the natural environment and our natural resources. We embrace uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion. And, and we need to uh, and, uh, support those things that bring back uh, uh, the current state out of the financial crisis that we're in. I want everyone to have improved lives here in Connecticut. I want to keep our young people in Connecticut and keep our seniors here in Connecticut where they built their lives. Thank you, Mr. Cabrera, your opening statement. Thank you so much. Thank you to the Chamber for hosting this event, and thank you to Senator Logan for participating in this event. My name is George Cabrera, and uh, I want to be your state senator. Uh, you know, I'm a first-generation college graduate. My mom and dad uh, have a working class background, worked really hard uh, to give me an opportunity to go on and, and do better. And those are the values that I grew up with. Those are the values that I live every single day in my job, representing grocery workers all across this great state. And as I talk to voters up and down the 17th district, from not going to talk all the way down here, one thing is clear. Everyone that I meet is struggling with a variety of issues. Uh, the first one that's a big one is healthcare. Healthcare is too expensive, deductibles are too high, premiums are too much. We need to do something about that. That's why I'm a supporter of the Connecticut Public Health Option which is a bill that was introduced by last year didn't get off the ground when they intend to, to be a champion for. The second is jobs. People are working really, really hard and they're not making it. They're not making enough money to support their kids and pay their bills. And then the third is the pandemic. We've got to do a better job to make sure that people have PPE and frontline workers have the necessary um, PPE to be protected and make sure that we do and make a lot of this PPE here in the state. I live with my values. This district deserves a state senator that will fight for them. Our current state senator doesn't. I will. Thank you. Uh, our first question for Mr. Logan starts with his response first. 39 states allow either for multi-day in-person voting and or no excuse voting by mail to encourage participation in our representative democracy. Here in Connecticut, that would require amending the state constitution. In light of the difficulties this year with voting, concerns about the coronavirus, concerns about delays in mailing ballots, would you support early voting in Connecticut? And how high a priority would this expansion of voting rights in Connecticut be for you? That's a great question. You know, here in Connecticut, as well as across the country, voting is an important, important right for folks. And it's important that here in Connecticut, we make voting uh, as accessible to as many people as possible. The notion of expanding absentee ballots or no excuse voting or mail-in voting, I think is something that uh, should be explored. It should be developed in great detail to come up with something that could potentially work. And then it should be put to a referendum so that the people of Connecticut could vote and decide whether that is the direction that they want to go. I'm glad that the senator is in favor of that. Uh, I'm a little confused because when he was in the legislature, he voted no to put that very amendment up for the voters to vote on. Voting is critical. It is the bedrock of our democracy. This election is a critical election. It's a, one, it's a generational election that will impact millions of people. And it's fundamental. We make voting too hard in the state of Connecticut. We need to make it easier. The facts are our families are busy. They're working really long hours. They're juggling their children after school. Some have a second job. And voting is way too cumbersome in the state of Connecticut. I'm in favor of making it easier. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Logan, any rebuttal? Yeah, so this is the sort of trend that you get from my opponent, uh, providing uh, half-truths or convoluting or not really giving the full story. Certainly, I don't vote on a bill based on the title. And I'm not telling you here today that I'm going to vote on a no excuse absentee voting expansion without looking at the details. The details matter. It's important that we come up with a system that is actually going to work and that is going to uh, make sure that uh, fraud is not a potential an issue. Right now, with the uh, uh, mail-in voting absentee ballot expansion, there are all kinds of problems that we have right here in Connecticut. People receiving the wrong ballots, Ballots going to the wrong location. Those are the kinds of things that need to be worked into any plan in the future. Mr. Cabrera? Unfortunately, the senator is incorrect. Um, the fact is he had an opportunity to give the voters of Connecticut an opportunity for them to vote, and he voted no. 
Um, the data bears it out. There have been multiple studies on, on this. Um, the, the incidences of fraud are very small. The fact is, uh, mail-in voting and early voting has been done all across our country. Um, and by and large, it is safe and it is uh, effective in states like Oregon and across many other states. We're seeing lines all over the country in early voting. People are waiting in line sometimes 10, 11, 12 hours. We must do better. Thank you. Uh, second question, Mr. Cabrera answers first. We saw Black Lives Matter demonstrations in many cities and towns in Connecticut this summer. How are you planning to address the issues illuminated by these protests? And how do you plan to ensure that the voices of underrepresented groups are taken into consideration in the legislative process? Yeah, we, this is a, a very important issue. You know, we, the fact is we have not been investing in the things uh, that are important to grow and develop uh, functional adults in it and raise families, uh, whether it's funding our public schools, uh, making sure that we are funding mental health services, um, making sure that we're having job training programs and making education more affordable. A lot of these socioeconomic issues need to be addressed. They're long overdue. They're systemic. They've been going on for a very long time, disproportionately in black and brown communities, and we must do a better job. And I plan on being a champion um, for a lot of the issues that have been brought up from the Black Lives Matter movement. They're important. Uh, they will be addressed, and it's something that I've been working on for a very long time in the labor movement, around wages, around job security, health care, all important issues and issues we must tackle. Thank you. Mr. Logan. Yes, the issues that were brought up with the many peaceful protests that occurred throughout the 17th District, I did my best to attend as many of those as possible. Uh, the issues that were brought up there uh, certainly uh, point to the fact that there's a, a segment of the population who certainly feels that more needs to be done uh, in the area of, uh, of social justice, in the area of jobs. And that's why it's important that we as a state here in Connecticut recognize and realize what is the problem that we have here. The current leadership in Hartford, many of who support my opponent, are the ones that put us in this situation and continue to uh, um, push this forward and put the people in our urban areas in more and more problem. I'm looking to change that here in Connecticut. We do that by bringing jobs to Connecticut, providing people with opportunities, I think it's important that the issues that were brought up uh, by the peaceful protests are taken into account when we go into the next uh, session because it's a budget session next year. And I intend and I plan to utilize what I heard at the peaceful protest uh, to help move and make Connecticut better and improve the quality of life for everyone living here in Connecticut. Thank you, Mr. Cabrera. Any additional thoughts on this? Yes, thank you. Um, the issues that we have to tackle um, are complex, they're also, they're also systemic, and they're not going to be solved overnight, but we need leadership on these issues, and we need a state senator that's going to stand up for the things that matter the most. Uh, the fact is, there are two very important pieces of legislation last year that the senator had an opportunity to tackle exactly what he just said. That was uh, the paid family leave law, which allows an inf uh, a mother to stay home with her infant child without fear of losing her job, or losing a paycheck, or taking care of a loved one. That helps families and helps the, uh, those problems. Or raising our minimum wage. Workers need a raise. Senator Logan voted no on giving workers a raise. These are fundamental things that would help solve the very problems we're talking about. Mr. Logan? Uh, thank you. So again, my opponent with half the story. When it comes to paid family medical leave, I support paid family medical leave. I have said that repeatedly. I've also said I don't vote on a bill simply because of the title. The version of the paid family medical leave bill that passed is going to result in a uh, half a percent payroll tax, a reduction in your pay, beginning on January 1st of this year. Everyone in Connecticut is going to get a reduction in their, in their pay. I supported a paid family medical leave bill that gave folks the option, the choice to buy into it. So that is what the issue is. And if you take a look at it, the only people in Connecticut who will not have to pay the half percent payroll tax are union workers. No surprise, my opponent supports the, the bill as it is written. Uh, next question, Mr. Logan has the first response. What, if anything, would you do differently in regards to how Connecticut is handling the pandemic? For example, if you were responsible for the reopening of our Connecticut public schools, what would your policy be? Did you support the extension of the governor's emergency powers? I'll start with the uh, second part of that question. I did not 
uh, support the extension of the governor's emergency powers. Um, I think we've been operating too long through executive order. Uh, I do believe that Connecticut, one, needs to get back to work. We need to find a way to uh, better work with the pandemic that we have, uh, that we're dealing with now. Uh, I want the legislature to be able to do their job. I want us to be able to uh, have the ideas and thoughts and opinions of the people in our district that we represent have a say when it comes to creating executive orders. Right now, Governor Lamont uh, is bypassing the legislature. I think that's wrong. I don't think that's the way to go. Uh, I would include the legislature. I would include the voices of the people of Connecticut, and I would have more discussion uh, as we look to work through this uh, pandemic. Thank you, Mr. Rivera. This is a crisis that has uh, revealed the incredible income inequality and gaps in opportunity in our state. And in a crisis, uh, we're supposed to come together. In a crisis, we're supposed to support our leaders. Uh, the fact is the governor has been doing a really incredible job leading us through this pandemic. We have some of the lowest infection rates in the country. Um, we are helping our workers, frontline workers, especially workers I deal with every day in grocery stores, uh, making sure they have PPE. And in a time of crisis, uh, we got to come together uh, across party lines as Connecticut residents and citizens to fight this pandemic. And that's what we have to keep doing. And I intend to continue to champion making sure workers are protected, making sure that schools have effective contact tracing, and that we are doing everything we can uh, to lower the infection rates and to make sure that we keep our people safe. Yes, I absolutely um, feel that it is important that we recognize that we are in a pandemic and that we must absolutely work together. But that means including the voices of everyone, not just of the, of the governor. Now, I would agree in terms of the communication that's been coming from Hartford uh, has been good. But now, as we are talking about extending in, uh, the, ex the expansion of the executive orders, that is what I was commenting on. We are able to come together as a legislature for special session in July, another special session on October 1st. We can come together to uh, make sure that we move forward as a state and make sure that the voices of everyone in the state of Connecticut is heard as we collectively figure out and decide how we want to move forward in terms of this pandemic. There are many folks in the 17th district that are not happy with the way the governor is uh, executing these executive orders without them having a say. And that is what I would like to do, and I would do, if I had uh, the option. Mr. Cabrera? You know, the facts are, are what they are. Um, when you have one of the lowest infection rates in the country, um, it's really hard to say that your leadership isn't doing a good job. You know, there's always going to be challenges, but we really have to get to a point where we put politics aside and we focus on making sure that the infection rates stay low, that our nursing home workers are safe and uh, make sure our kids are safe, make sure we're supporting frontline workers with hazard pay and, and PPE and protections. So, I and mean, that's what I'm focused on. That's what I could, will continue to be focused on and supporting anyone who is in favor of that. Thank you. Our next question. About 85,000 Connecticut residents receive assistance through the Affordable Care Act in paying their health insurance premiums and many more are covered under the expansion of Husky Medicaid. If the Affordable Care Act is overturned in court, many of them will be unable to afford their premiums. What steps would you support to guarantee that they continue to receive assistance? And Mr. Kerber, your first response. This is a, a critical issue, a critical issue in our, in our state and in our district. And I meet people every single day knocking on doors and on the phone who are struggling to pay their health care bills. Uh, many of them are making very difficult decisions about whether to take their medication or not, or whether to uh, put and postpone uh, procedures. Uh, the fact is the ACA is uh, on the chopping block. We are looking at a very serious situation. I would do everything in my power to make sure people have access to high quality, affordable health care. And that means uh, being a champion for that, what I've been doing for a long time, and I support, uh, would be fighting for and supporting the Connecticut Public Option Bill, which didn't make it out of the Senate last session. In addition to that, we've got to make sure we extend Husky. We have a lot of kids who are uh, need to be covered, and that's a very important thing. We have to make sure our kids have coverage and that they're able to have access to good quality uh, health care. This is a fundamental uh, difference between my opponent and I. I believe health care should be a right, not a privilege afforded to the few. 
And that is where we have to head. This is the richest, most powerful country on the face of the earth. We have got to figure out how to get health care to our citizens. Mr. Logan. Thank you. So I guess my opponent failed to uh, remember that I'm uh, actually on uh, the board of directors of Griffin Hospital. Uh, health care is extremely important to me. And Looking at preventative care is important. The question has to do with the Affordable Care Act. So I, uh, I and other legislators took action in terms of passing a bill um, which would ensure uh, what we call the uh, essential benefits, that they remain part of our health insurance. So regardless of what happens on the federal, on the national level with the Affordable Care Act, where we have committed as a state uh, to make sure that we maintain the level of emergency services that we have now. Uh, hospitalization, maternity and newborn health care, mental health and substance abuse uh, use disorder, prescription drugs, rehabilitative and habilitative services and devices, laboratory services, preventative and wellness care, pediatric services including oral and vision care. That is the type of action that I took during the uh, during uh, a past uh, session to make sure that regardless of what happens in Washington, and we're looking at our congressional delegations and the federal government to fix our health care system, but in the meantime, we took action here in Connecticut. I was a part of that and I'm proud to have been a part of that to make sure that we are able to maintain those essential benefits regardless of what happens with the Affordable Care Act. Mr. Gerber. Well, it, this is a, a very important issue. As I mentioned, I'm glad that uh, Senator Logan believes everyone should have health care. Uh, perhaps you should uh, let the president know, uh, the leader of his party, who is right now actively in court seeking to eliminate the Affordable Care Act and throw millions of people off of health care, including many children here in the state of Connecticut. Um, this is part of what's wrong with our politics, and we have to make sure that we elect the right people who are going to champion making sure people have access to affordable health care, and that's something I've been doing my, for 25 years and will continue to do in the state Senate. Thank you, Mr. Logan. Well, and again, you can see my opponent not recognizing what actual job he's applying for here. He's working to be, he's a, a campaign to be a state senator. We go to Hartford, we deal with the governor, we deal with Governor uh, Lamont. We do not go to Washington. Our congressional delegation deals with it. It is not my role as a state senator to be uh, telling the president directly how to run the country. I do it through our congressional delegation. I have written our congressional delegation. I have met with them multiple times to let them know what the people in our district want. I support all policies that come out of Washington that help Connecticut, and I am critical and I criticize any policies that come out of Washington, regardless of who the president is, if it's gonna hurt our state. Thank you. Uh, due to the nature of the next question, you'll each have 90 seconds to answer it, and there will be no rebuttals. Uh, Mr. Logan. In 2020, what does it mean to you to be a Republican? Thank you. A good question. So for me to be a Connecticut Republican, first and foremost, uh, I am here to support uh, the U.S. Constitution and the state constitution. Uh, that is very important. Uh, here in Connecticut, as a Connecticut Republican, we are trying to make sure that uh, individual freedoms and liberties are maintained here in Connecticut. I want people to be able to make choices in their lives. Uh, individual responsibility is important. And to make sure that we have uh, equality for everyone here in Connecticut. Equal uh, uh, opportunities so that folks can uh, uh, achieve uh, what they can in their lives. They can achieve and meet their potential. That's to me what it means to be a Connecticut Republican. Mr. Cabrera, in 2020, what does it mean to you to be a Democrat? Uh, to me, it means that you believe in freedom, uh, you believe in liberty, responsibility, opportunity, but it also means that you acknowledge that in society when there are large gaps between uh, opportunity and promise, that you step in and you fight for working people, that you make sure that you develop and fight for policies that create more honor ramps into the middle class, that you acknowledge that we have Thank you. too much income inequality, that too much of our tax policies favors the very rich, the millionaires and billionaires at the very top at the expense of the middle class and the working class. It means that you acknowledge that health care should be a right, that everyone has a, the right to go to a good school where they can get a fantastic education and live out their dreams. It means that workers have a right to collectively bargain, to come together and to demand good working conditions and great benefits on the job. 
It means that we have a right to be safe in our homes, in our streets, in our parks, and are able to walk down the street with our children. These are things that are at the core of what it means uh, to be a Democrat, to be an American Democrat. And these are values I hold dearly, working class values, middle class values, who believe in the American dream, but are willing to fight for that American dream for everyone, not just the few at the top. Thank you. The Governor's Council on Climate Change, GC3, was established to ensure that the state of Connecticut is on a path to meet its greenhouse gas emissions goal by 2050. It remains a national leader in addressing climate change. What will you do to ensure that the important recommendations that come out of the GC3 become policy and are vigorously implemented in Connecticut? Mr. Cabrera has the first response. I'm sorry, can you repeat the question one more time? Sure. The Governor's Council on Climate Change, GC3, mm -hmm. was established to ensure that the state of Connecticut is on a path to meet its greenhouse gas emissions goals, goals by 2050 and remains a national leader in addressing climate change. Will you? What will you do to ensure that the important recommendations that come out of the GC3 become policy and are vigorously implemented in Connecticut? So the, having a clean environment, clean water, and clean air uh, is a right of every human being. Um, I grew up in a community where uh, it was a light industrial zone and I didn't have access to lots of clean air and water. And as I got older and went to college, I had a deep appreciation for uh, making sure that uh, we have open space, making sure that the quality of our environment is I would do everything in my power to support um, any recommendation that lowers greenhouse gases, gets us closer to carbon zero, and helps out, out of the transition. I think the transitions are very important to allow businesses, small and mid-sized businesses especially, to transition into more of a carbon-free um, output. I think that's critical. I think there's also an opportunity here to create green jobs and create a new market for good skilled jobs in a new green economy. Thank you. Mr. Logan. I think it's important that in any decision that we uh, make as uh, legislators um, passing any laws or bills that uh, we consider certainly the environment. Uh, I'm looking forward to seeing those uh, recommendations on ways uh, to uh, reduce our greenhouse gas emissions. But again, I need to see the details because it's important that we actually see what those recommendations are and there will be recommendations. We need to make sure as legislators that we do our job to make sure that it's actually going to uh, help uh, the state of Connecticut and not hurt our state. And we also need to make sure that we make sure and maintain the balance between trying to make changes to address uh, items such as the environment and, uh, and climate change and our economy. It's important to remember uh, that the, the two are not uh, mutually exclusive. Uh, one affects the other, and it's important. And the legislature uh, has a, a history of passing uh, irresponsible legislation uh, that has actually cost and made our uh, state less affordable uh, for folks. And, and again, I am looking at affordability, and it's incredibly important that anything that comes out of the legislature in terms of bills and ideas, that we consider what the impact is going to be in terms of uh, cost, the, the cost of living for folks in Connecticut, and the affordability here uh, in Connecticut. Thank you. Mr. Cabrera? If this is uh, an issue that we can tackle. Um, the facts are climate change is real. It's happening rapidly. And uh, we've had a, a dereliction of duty at the federal level with um, getting rid of very important environmental regulations, uh, a whole host of issues. And so here in Connecticut, we have an opportunity to be a leader and make sure that we continue to protect our waterways, our shore, uh, our air, um, our wind. And I think we need to really be very uh, proactive in making sure that we do everything we can to make sure that we have a cleaner, safer, greener environment. Mr. Logan. Um, again, in terms of uh, climate change, it is important that we focus on the environment. It is important that we take those recommendations very seriously, and we just need to make sure that whatever those recommendations are, that it's something that the state can uh, afford to do. Uh, the timeline will have to be uh, looked at, and what the effect or impact is going to be on folks being able to uh, be able to afford to live here in Connecticut to make those uh, changes. There's always a give and take. Uh, I am looking forward to seeing those recommendations. I think it is important that we reduce our greenhouse uh, gases here in, uh, in Connecticut and we do our part, uh, but the details matter. I'm looking forward to seeing those recommendations. Thank you. 
<clears throat> Mr. Wilbing, this uh, question is for you to respond to. First, how can the legislature address lack of affordable housing in many municipalities that is the result of exclusionary zoning and land use policy? So when we're talking about affordable housing, one, I think that's extremely important. And affordable housing is an area where, one, being giving people the opportunity to be able to, one, be able to afford and pay for their housing through a vibrant economy where folks have opportunities for employment, opportunities to work, where they can then be able to save and build and be able to live where they want to. As far as uh, going into um, uh, outside of uh, communities and forcing communities to, um, for example, let's take a look at uh, Woodbridge. Woodbridge has an issue of affordable uh, housing where there's a lawsuit against them. They're looking to build a multi-unit uh, um, uh, affordable housing um, facility on a one and a half acre property. Woodbridge, most, most of Woodbridge doesn't have public water. They have wells. They don't have sewers. They have septic. So we need to look at the details in terms of where we're looking at affordable housing. I want to encourage communities and, and, and municipalities to look at ways to make affordable housing something that can work for their community. And we need to do more as a state to, uh, to do that. Uh, but in terms of uh, uh, forcing uh, affordable housing on uh, communities that uh, perhaps are not uh, set up because of the geography, not set up because of the uh, municipal uh, utilities. You know, as a, a, a water uh, guy for over 28 years, I know the importance and significance of having a septic system, for example, that's too large and that can contaminate neighbors' wells. It's important that we consider all that. But affordable housing is something that is very important to me, and I want to make sure that people have the ability to pay for housing and have the ability through opportunities for work and vibrant jobs to live wherever they want in our great state of Connecticut. Mr. Cabrera. Owning a home is uh, the bedrock of the American dream. Uh, when you own your own home, you have more stability for your family. It provides more stability for a community. And it is critical. And we need to do more to make housing more affordable. But we also have to be honest with ourselves and address the history of discrimination when it comes to housing. Whether it's redlining or discriminating against renters, um, the data on this is crystal clear. And we need to uh, acknowledge that there are some systemic issues we need to tackle. And it begins with uh, making sure that we are, again, providing those on-ramps to the middle class and making housing more affordable. But attached to that, which is really important, is good paying jobs, making sure people have access to training you know, and college affordability. Because when someone has a job that pays well and pays a good middle class salary, they will be able to afford that home. So we have to uh, be honest and address the systemic history um, and making sure we make things affordable, but also in, in make sure that we have those on ramps and people have the opportunity to purchase their home and rent their home. It's critical, it provides stability, it's good public policy, it's great for our kids, and it provides a great benefit to everyone in the state of Connecticut. Thank you, Mr. Logan. Yeah, so when my opponent talks about uh, systemic uh, history, you know, I look at the last 10, 20 years where, look at the state of Connecticut, the majority party is in charge of the executive spot, the governor's spot, in charge of most of our major cities. Uh, the, the treasurer, the comptroller, you know, the issue here is that we need to go in a different direction. We need a vibrant economy here in Connecticut, and that's why I keep talking about the financial crisis that we're in, because until we solve that financial crisis here in Connecticut, and we make opportunities more available for folks to work and to be able to uh, uh, pull themselves and advance in our state, in Connecticut, uh, we are going to have uh, this, this same issue uh, uh, reoccurring. So that is why we need to go in a different direction. We need to make Connecticut more affordable. We need a vibrant economy here in Connecticut, and continuing to tax and make it more expensive to live here is not the way to achieve that. Mr. Cabrera. Well, one of the ways you make Connecticut more affordable is by giving people a raise, which Senator Logan opposed by voting no against the minimum wage. One of the ways you make people's lives easier and make it more affordable is helping them so they don't lose their jobs when they have a newborn child or have a sick grandmother or grandma that they gotta take, a, take care of. The paid family leave law. Again, you voted no on that. You know, it, these are the, the kinds of issues, and sometimes I feel like there's a huge disconnection here, um, but when I talk to people in Derby and in Sony and Niagara talk, parts of Hamden and the Valley, um, they are working hard, they're doing the right things. It's just that they're not being given a chance, and that's what I intend to fight for. Mr. 
Cabrera, you went through his first response to this next question. How important is the equity and environmental justice movement in Connecticut to you? And what do you feel are the most relevant, their most relevant concerns? What specific actions will you take to support their calls for change? Well, environmental equity is, uh, justice is very, very important. Um, the fact is that we have, uh, unfortunately, parts of our district and our state where um, we have a desperate need for significant remediation and environmental cleanup. Uh, in the Valley, in Derby, and so on and other places, there are lots of properties that are contaminated, and it makes it difficult to make them attractive for companies and businesses to come in and set up shop. And so one of the things I'm going to be fighting for is making sure we identify grants and bonding money to help get those properties ready for development. And that's something that you have to be proactive as a state senator. You have to get in there and fight for your district and make sure that you have those funds. And also, you got to be honest about uh, the history in some parts of the district. And, you know, Southern Hammond, for instance, you know, we have a property that uh, has been issues in it and has been sitting there for many, many years undeveloped. And that's something that I plan on tackling to make sure we find funds for that to get those properties cleaned up, help work with developers and real estate developers and others in the community to work together to you know finally get these properties um, to be a vibrant part of the community. Mr. Logan. You know, so when you talk about uh, finding the funds to develop these properties, you know, the state has been uh, spending a lot of time and effort uh, cleaning up uh, a lot of these contaminated sites, a lot of these brownfields. The issue that we have here in Connecticut is that the fact that because of the uh, expensive regulations, the high cost of doing business here in Connecticut, companies don't want to come here to build on those sites. We need to change that. We need to make Connecticut more attractive for businesses to come here. We need to be able to prove and show them that we are not just going to increase the cost of living through uh, taxes, increase the cost of doing business here with, with more and more expensive regulations. This past uh, special session, uh, we uh, uh, passed the bill, the Transfer Act, because we recognize that uh, here in Connecticut, we've gone too far. We made it too difficult for companies to develop on our sites. We need to be smarter in terms of making sure that the regulations that we have here in Connecticut is not discouraging businesses from coming here, not discouraging businesses from building and setting up shop here in Connecticut. That is the best way that we can have uh, uh, manufacturing, uh, we can have development uh, in all of our uh, towns, particularly uh, when you look at the, uh, the Naugatuck Valley and there are parts of Hamden uh, as well. Uh, I look forward to trying to move the state in a way and in a direction that's going to make it more attractive for businesses and make it more attractive for people to uh, want to stay here, live here, work, and encourage uh, businesses to want to set up shop here and we need more people working, more people paying taxes to get us out of this financial situation that we're in now. Mr. Cabrera? You know, um, it's really important that um, we support small businesses. Small businesses create the bulk of our jobs. And, you know, one place we can start, and I talk to manufacturers all the time, is by helping them lower their utility rates. We have one of the highest utility rates in the country. And that is a cost, a high cost of doing business. So um, while remediating property is important, we also can make it easier for them to lower their costs. And that is one easy way uh, to do it. Mr. Logan. Yes, here in Connecticut, the cost of doing business is high and certainly utilities are one of those areas. Um, but you know, I would say that a lot of the reasoning for why the utility rates are so high is because of the irresponsible uh, legislation coming from the majority leadership here in the state of Connecticut that has resulted in, again, making it more expensive for businesses to be here, making it more expensive for us for our utilities here in Connecticut. And I have specific uh, plans and, and actions to try to make sure and to try to reduce the cost of utilities here uh, in Connecticut. Mr. Logan, you have the first response to the next question. What do you feel are the most effective strategies to significantly increase revenue in Connecticut? The most significant strategy that we can do is one, not to increase the size of our state government. We need smaller government here in Connecticut. We need less regulations. We need to stop increasing 
taxes. If we do that, businesses here in Connecticut will want to stay in Connecticut. They will want to expand their workforce and hire more people. The only way that we are going to be able to uh, get this state out of this financial crisis in a sustainable way is by having, again, more people working, paying taxes, as opposed to what we have now. We're scaring businesses out of Connecticut, people are leaving Connecticut, and those of us that are left behind, we're shouldering more and more of the tax burden. Mr. Cabrera? So, you know, what we, it's really uh, an ecosystem. Um, there's lots of things that are really important, and you gotta be able to have good schools. If you have good schools that educate kids and give them an opportunity to live out their dreams, you're gonna help real estate prices, you're gonna attract people to move into your community, as well as businesses, because they want an educated workforce. Uh, you also have to make business, uh, the cost of doing business more affordable, especially for small mom and pop businesses. The cost of, of setting up the cost remediation, they need, they need help with that. And you gotta have robust training programs. You know, the fact is we have a manufacturing sector that is doesn't have a pipeline right now. We need to do a better job of making manufacturing jobs, trade jobs more affordable um, for kids to go into. We don't wanna go to a four-year institution. That's something I've been doing for a long time. Uh, working with the trades, good paying middle class jobs, uh, plumbers, pipe fitters, uh, carpenters, uh, good jobs that you can fill uh, right now. And it's about investing in those kinds of careers and again, creating those on ramps to the middle class. If we do that, more people will move here, more people will have good paying jobs, which means we'll have more tax revenue as well. Mr. Logan. Yes, Mr. Cabrera continues to talk about the importance of manufacturing and businesses and jobs here in Connecticut, but you know, just about every idea, every plan, every uh, program that he supports, that he pushes forward, is only going to make it more expensive for us to live here in Connecticut. It's only going to uh, discourage businesses from wanting to expand here in Connecticut, from wanting to come to, here to Connecticut. You know, the majority of party leadership in Hartford continues to pass irresponsible legislation that is killing our, our, our economy. Uh, it's important that we recognize that, and I want to go back to Hartford, fight for you, and hopefully after November 3rd, I'll have more numbers of more conservative legislators that understand the importance of solving this financial crisis that we have here in Connecticut. Mr. Cabrera. You know, there, there's a, a, a real difference here, and that is that in order for Connecticut to do well and grow, you have to invest in people. No one begrudges anyone a profit. Uh, we have incredible businessmen and women in this state. But the, fact, the facts are that people in the 17th district, many of them, um, especially in the Valley, are struggling because there's not the opportunity being presented to them to do well. Uh, whether it's healthcare or wages or schools, we need to do a much better job of helping and supporting those folks to get to the middle class. Thank you. Uh, first response on the next question is from Mr. Cabrera. It's been reported that Governor Lamont has hired the Boston Consulting Group to do a review of Connecticut government with the aim of reducing costs by at least $500 million. What areas of Connecticut state government do you believe can provide this level of savings? Well, you always have to look at savings in state government. I mean, uh, the, fact are, the facts are that there's many places you can cut the fat. Um, especially when you have uh, duplication, you have uh, agencies that may be doing some of the same functions. You always want to look um, to find savings there and make sure you have strong, robust um, state government. And those things are, are really important. At the same time, um, our workforce in Connecticut is not about 8,000 workers um, since the last governor. And uh, we're seeing a lot of strain on the system. Um, in some of these departments where overtime is running way over the state police department, for instance, has, has a very large um, overtime cost. And that's due in, in part because we don't have the right staffing levels to do a lot of these functions. And so there's a balance and there's a tension. And you have to be wise about it and make sure you use the taxpayers' dollars wisely. But we have to be prudent about it and you have to take it on a case-by-case -case basis. Mr. Logan. Clearly, Mr. Cabrera is not the individual that's going to shrink uh, state uh, government. Uh, I believe that uh, uh, looking at public-private partnerships where they work uh, can help to reduce the size of, uh, of government. Um, you know, I believe that uh, taking a look at how we go about the functions of state government is important. I believe that we should look uh, top-down and, and blueprint and look at how we 
accomplish the goals and objectives, whether it's with a DMV and renewing driver's licenses and registrations, um, or, or whether it's the way that uh, you know, we run our many, many different agencies. Uh, it's important that we take a fresh and good look at that. I do believe there are significant savings that can be made there. I, and I, too, am um, interested in, in, in looking forward to seeing what these recommendations are. I mean, can they get to 500 uh, uh, million? It, it depends on what the recommendations are and over what period of time. And But we certainly need to make sure that we maintain these those essential services that are provided uh, by the state government here in Connecticut. And again, we can uh, do that uh, by one way of looking at public-private partnerships where it works, whether it's in uh, with uh, uh, men, uh, mental health, whether it's with, uh, related to, to health care, whether it's uh, you know, re related to jobs programs. Uh, we can do this. We can be more effective and more efficient. I mean, we, I mean even look at the DOT, for example. And when you take a look at the, uh, at the number of miles of roads that we have and the cost per mile that we spend to maintain those roads here in, in, in Connecticut and at the administrative level, uh, it, again, there are areas that we can look at, and I'm the individual that could do that better than my opponent because he's only going to want to grow state government. He wants bigger government. I want leaner, smaller government. Mr. Cabrera. Not true. Uh, of course, I want efficiency. Of course, I want to have uh, a government that works well. But it's important that you listen very carefully to what he said because he's not talking about people anymore. These are people who plow our, our streets when we have a snowstorm. These are people who teach our children in the classroom. These are people who take care of our seniors in nursing homes. People who are out cleaning our parks and our public spaces. That's what we should be thinking about. Real people who work hard every single day trying to put food on the table. That's what I think about every day and that's who I'll be fighting for. Mr. Logan? Clearly, clearly the services that are required here to run our state will be accomplished with people, by people. Uh, so I am not talking about necessarily eliminating uh, positions in terms of how we get the work done. It's a matter of how we do it. And we certainly need to look to make sure when you talk about efficiency, you've got to look at management. You've got to look at how we are going about accomplishing those jobs and those roles and those uh, objectives uh, of the state. And I think it's important that we look at it with, uh, you know, with fresh eyes and make sure that we include everyone, including those workers who are on the front lines. Many times the state workers, they know where the, where the inefficiencies are in their departments and they can provide us with some great ideas on how to make our state government more effective and more efficient. Mr. Logan, this uh, question is for you to respond to first. Would you support legislation to modernize the 40-year-old beverage bottle deposit law, the bottle bill? If so, how would you support it? If not, why not? Yeah, in terms of our bottle law here, in terms of recycling, very important. Again, we're talking about the economy, right? We're talking about the environment. Uh, the issue here, though, is that it is a complex one when you take a look at our uh, bottle laws and deposit laws. Um, there's uh, some camps that just want to increase the deposit fee. They think that'll do the, uh, the trick. But again, making it more uh, less affordable for folks, more expensive for folks to buy uh, their groceries, for example. Uh, we can take a look at adding things, like let's say adding nips to be recycled. Well, you know, take a look at where does all this recycling happen? It mostly happens in, in supermarkets. I've spoken to managers at Stop and Shop and, uh, and at ShopRite and in Hamden and in Derby uh, and in Naugatuck. And they say, look, they don't even sell liquor, right? But they're the ones who are, are taking the most of the a lot of the burden in terms of recycling. It's an issue that is very important, but it is a complex one that we need to look at. But I am absolutely in favor of doing more to improve uh, the system that we have now. Mr. Cabrera, yeah, we we definitely uh, need to do more to modernize our recycling program and adding nips and other plastic products are really important. You know, uh, I represent the workers at Stop and Shop, and uh, I'm at the Stop and Shop in Naugatuck and Sonia all the time. And uh, I always see people lined up at those recycling uh, facilities, and uh, they're struggling. They're, they're trying to make ends meet, and they're trying to do everything they can. And so when I think of, of any policy, uh, this one included, I think about the human lives behind it and how we impact it, and that's going to be my focus. Mr. Logan? Yes, again, I think it's important that um, 
we look to modernize our recycling program here in Connecticut. Uh, I think it's absolutely something that I will uh, uh, pay attention to and be involved in and be looking for ways to improve the system than what we have right now. Because ev right now everyone agrees that it needs to be improved and we need to work together to make it done, to get it done. Mr. Rivera, any final thoughts? Uh, no, other than to say that it's something that definitely is, uh, needs to be looked at and modernized. Mr. Gerber, this next question uh, leads off with your response. Uh, do you feel the PURA and Connecticut City Council should be more accountable to the people of Connecticut? If so, what kind of changes do you feel are needed? Yes, I do. I believe uh, that city councils should have more of a community voice uh, when they make their decisions. I think it's important that there's transparency um, regarding their deliberations when they make decisions. We're dealing with an issue right now in Hamden um, with the tower, and we, it's very important that we have community input and that there's access for public comment. And I know there is now, but there needs to be more of a community voice on that. And I think that that's, those boards need to reflect the will of the people in the, in the communities where these proposals are being made. Mr. Logan? Yeah, I mean, I definitely think that more can be done in terms of transparency with the siting council. I find that uh, often communities, uh, in terms of communication, see, get the, are surprised in terms of uh, what goes before the siting council, and uh, oftentimes uh, folks uh, feel that they uh, just weren't involved early enough in the process. So I'm certainly uh, in favor of uh, working to uh, improve communication and improve uh, transparency as it relates to the uh, the siting councils. Thank you, Mr. Cabrera. I would only add that, you know, a part of, I'm sure you're seeing a theme here, a part of everything that I look at when it comes to policy is are the people in the community being heard? Do they have a seat at the table? Are their voices, um, do their voices matter in the deliberation and decision making? And is the structure of power set up in a way that is democratic, open and honest, and does the will of the people? Mr. Logan. Yes, again, siting council is extremely important on many different matters, um, whether it's uh, for cell phone you know, towers or water tanks or uh, you know, solar uh, farms. It is important that uh, the people of our, our district, their voices are heard, and that they uh, know and that the information is communicated to them in a timely manner. I do think that that needs to be improved. Thank you. Uh, now, a specific follow-up siting council question. Mr. Logan has the first response. There is a petition before the Connecticut Siding Council to remove 15 acres of trees on Gaylord Mountain Road in Hamden to install a solar facility. What is your opinion of removing acres of trees in a forest to install a solar facility? Well, you know, here in the state we talk about how we want to um, reduce uh, greenhouse uh, gases. Uh, we want to support renewable energy uh, projects and initiatives. And there's a balance that needs to be had, right, in terms of, one, the uh, uh, locations, one, the uh, community uh, impact. Um, so I think uh, in terms of Gaylord Mountain Road uh, in Hamden, uh, it's, you know, it's, it's a re relatively residential area. Uh, I would question whether that is a, an ideal site for a solar farm of that size. Uh, I would uh, be looking to find other uh, locations that were perhaps a bit more uh, remote uh, for that type of, uh, of installation. Uh, but I want to hear more of the details, and I want to make sure that the folks uh, in the community, uh, in, uh, particularly in Hamden, particularly in the northern part of Hamden, uh, have their uh, say. Uh, I think the visual impact and the community impact is definitely very important. Uh, the folks in, in Hamden and in all the 17th districts take pride uh, in the natural environment that we have here uh, in Connecticut. And so I, I, I think this is something that uh, we should take very uh, seriously, uh, and that the will and the thoughts of the people, particularly in the immediate neighborhood uh, of that project, uh, should be heard and should be uh, taken to account. Mr. Cabrera. I actually live not far from Gaylord Mountain Road, and I've been uh, contacted by many people who live in that neighborhood, and that is not a good fit. Um, we talk a lot about quality of life in the 17th district and making sure that people have communities that um, are safe and that provide a high level of, uh, of living. And this is one project that I think is a really bad idea. It's beautiful up in Gaylord Mountain Road. People move there uh, because of the landscape and because of the natural beauty. 
It's a great neighborhood. Uh, lots of uh, people walking and biking and walking their dogs I see all the time. And um, I think it's the wrong project for our district, and I will actively oppose it. Thank you. Mr. Logan? Yes, I certainly uh, feel that the uh, project, because uh, I too have heard from uh, many folks uh, in Hamden, uh, and even outside of Hamden in terms of this particular uh, project, it is certainly uh, one that doesn't seem to have the support uh, of the community, uh, and I will certainly watch it uh, you know, more closely and, and, and try to you know, work to see if that perhaps there's a, a, a more suitable location, uh, whether it's in Hamden or, or somewhere uh, else in, in, the, uh, in the general region. Uh, but it certainly appears that this project is... Uh, uh, that solar farm project uh, in, off of Gaylamont Road uh, is not the area for this type of uh, development. But I, I will continue to follow it and hear uh, both sides of the, uh, the argument and see if there's some sort of compromise that can be made with, through the leadership at the municipal level and uh, state level in terms of finding a more suitable location. Thank you. Mr. Cabrera? On this issue again? On this issue again? And listen, anything that we can do to uh, eliminate greenhouse gases in the air, uh, I'm for. Um, there has to be, um, obviously, a transition. You know, I have spent the last 25 years of my life fighting for workers to make sure they have good wages, health care, and are able to retire with dignity. So um, you have to also remember that there's uh, workers involved who have families, and so you want to have a good transition. But I think the science is pretty clear. Uh, we've got to do more to eliminate greenhouse gases from our environment and get to carbon zero. And it's important for the quality of life in Connecticut and it's good for our environment, it's good for our families. Thank you, Mr. Logan. Yes, you know, I, um, I'm focused on the environment and I'm constantly looking out for different the issues that come out in different parts of the state. For example, you know, I, I sit on the Housatonic Valley Association uh, Board of Directors, uh, um, you know, open space and the environment is very important. With the Killingly Power Plant, the issue there is that currently it's a coal-fired plant, and um, the company there wants to convert it uh, to a natural gas plant, still a fossil fuel. So there are a number of folks who are protesting uh, the conversion from coal even to natural gas because of the concern about fracking and those sorts of things. Um, so when you take a look at that, it's important that uh, we look, I believe it's an improvement to go from uh, a coal fire plant to natural gas. Uh, the company's claiming that it's a very uh, efficient system that they have there. Uh, and I think that it's a step process. We need to get to a point, I believe, where we are utilizing almost 100% renewable energies um, and getting away from fossil fuels, but we're not going to be able to do that all in, in, one, you know, in one take. So if we're going from a coal fire plant uh, to a natural gas uh, plant, uh, to me that's a, uh, an improvement. And it's one that buys us some time as we work towards going to the, uh, to the next step. Thank you, Mr. Rivera. Um, I have nothing else to add other than, you know, that it's really important that we watch out for the workers, but it's also important that we make sure we have cleaner uh, energy. Mr. Logan. Yeah, you know, again, it's uh, an issue that uh, has really brought out a lot of uh, emotions. Um, there are a number of uh, folks who uh, don't want any fossil fuels, and they want us to uh, cut all fossil fuels right now, immediately. Uh, my opinion is that, that we really uh, can't uh, do that without drastically uh, affecting the cost, again, of utilities and the cost of uh, heating and electricity here in Connecticut. So we need to do it uh, in a responsible uh, manner. Um, and, you know, projects like the Cleaning Project is one that I think we need to just uh, follow uh, and make sure that we do things in a smart, uh, smart manner. Thank you. Our next two questions come from uh, the audience. Uh, you all sent in comments, and uh, we have now two questions from our viewers. Uh, first response, Mr. Logan. Hartford Police have claimed that the Police Accountability Bill 
has resulted in an increase in crime. What is your opinion on that issue? Yeah, so the police accountability bill I often refer to as the anti-police bill. Uh, I am in favor of police uh, reform. I am in favor of improving our policing uh, in our communities and in our state. Uh, but that anti-police bill that was passed in uh, July uh, really uh, pushed our law enforcement uh, over the cliff. It's making it uh, more difficult for them to do their jobs. Um, it's going to um, encourage many uh, frivolous uh, lawsuits on good cops, good police officers. Uh, and we have heard from police officers throughout the 17th district, whether it's Naugatuck, Hamden, Ansonia, Derby, Woodbridge, that it's making it harder for them to uh, maintain and keep their current force. It's hurting in terms of uh, recruitment. And it's making our communities less safe, and that's the fact of the matter. So, again, it's a matter of I, I don't, and that's why I voted against that anti-police bill. I don't vote on a bill simply on the title. Last year, 2019, I voted on a police accountability and transparency bill that, um, for one thing, it, it required that police officers, whenever they use excessive force, whether it's chokeholds or any type of excessive force that could lead to bodily harm or injury, that they have to put it in their incident report. Also, it created a task force that started in January that was supposed to give recommendations to the legislature in terms of the ways that we can improve, improve our policing. But what happened in July with that anti-police bill was that it put our law enforcement in a precarious uh, situation and condition and it's made all of our communities uh, more uh, dangerous, less safe. I want to go back this next uh, session and fix that bill and I believe that I can do that far better than uh, my opponent because he believes that the bill was a good first step. He wants to take it even further. He wants less police in our communities. He wants to reduce the funding of folks in our community, and that's the wrong way to go. Mr. Rivera? My opponent is, once again, trying to distract from the issue. That's simply untrue. Um, I believe in public safety. I believe that police officers have an important role to play in our community. But I also believe that we should hold people accountable when they abuse their authority. And that's what legislation did. You know, the fact is, we often ask our police officers to do too much. Uh, a lot of times on these calls, they're entering very dangerous situations, sometimes domestic situations, mental health situations, um, situations that, quite frankly, they don't have the skills or are equipped to deal with. And so the, one of the things that was really good about the bill was the mental health screenings for police officers, which helps them you know, deal with the stress. Being a police officer is one of the most stressful jobs in our society. And we gotta get back to investing in mental health. Um, you know, just not long ago, uh, one of the shootings we had um, of a young black man who died, found out later on that he was uh, off his medication, had significant mental health issues, and issues of poverty, issues of joblessness. Um, it's, un it's unfair to expect our police officers to deal with all of our shortcomings because we don't invest in our schools, we don't invest in our mental health system, we don't invest in job training. That is patently unfair, and that's what we need to get back to. Thank you, Mr. Logan. Again, my opponent has this uh, repeated habit of favoring and supporting bills just on the title. Supporting and favoring bills because of aspects of the bill without looking at the overall effect of the bill. You know, we've got our law enforcement officials, professional law enforcement officials throughout the state and every community in the 17th district who are, are telling us, letting us know they have spent their careers on law enforcement and they have indicated to us that this is a bad bill, it's going to make it more difficult for them to do their jobs and we need to support our law enforcement and the, uh, whether, I don't know if it's, it's ignorance or arrogance of my opponent to think that he knows better than law enforcement how to best keep and protect the people in our district to me is just unbelievable. Mr. Cabrera? Look, I've got uh, several police officers in my family. Uh, we talk all the time. Um, I am not uh, against police officers. What I am against is when people abuse their authority and hurt, and in some cases, uh, murder uh, people. We've seen this happen throughout the country. Um, there is just no excuse for someone abusing their authority and we have to hold people accountable. And that's what I think the bill, the core of the bill did. Uh, but it also comes back to what I said earlier, which is we have to start investing in our communities again. Our second uh, <coughs> viewer call, uh, 
uh, starts with a response from Mr. Cabrera. What are the two most important areas of concern to you affecting the 17th district that you would focus on for the next two years in office, and what would you do to address these areas? So I've been knocking on doors up and down the 17th district in Derby and Sonia and Naugatuck, uh, Woodbridge, Hamden, Beacon Falls, Bethany. And one thing that's been perfectly clear is that people uh, are working incredibly hard, uh, but they need uh, more support. They need to know and believe that their hard work is going to pay off. So just a couple of two big areas I'm really concerned about. I meet people every single day who have health care that's not working for them. It's too expensive. Their prescription drugs are too expensive. They're putting procedures off because they're afraid of the bill. We have got to make sure we get high quality, affordable health care to every single citizen in the 17th edition. And that is something that I'm going to be prioritizing and focused on. The second thing is economic development in the Valley. I am tired of driving through Derby and Sonia and Naugatuck and seeing the empty buildings, the empty lots that are undeveloped. And that begins by being aggressive and focusing on getting the funds necessary to clean up a lot of these properties, to get them ready for market, to work with the local officials, to attract retail and developers to come in. And that's going to be a top part of it. When I win this race, I'm going to convene a meeting of all the elected officials in the 17th district, and we're going to sit down and come up with an agenda uh, and a list of projects and developments that they want are, are, are prioritized for them. And I'm going to work my heart out to make sure those things happen. Mr. Logan? Again, my opponent has the lack of understanding on how you grow and, and develop and make a vibrant economy. You do that by encouraging businesses to want to come to Connecticut, to want to stay in Connecticut. And right now, we're not doing that. You know, all the, uh, the majority party leadership in Hartford that many of them are supporting uh, my opponent, uh, they have continued to, bad, uh, to pass bad policy. Look at the, uh, the budget, the last budget bill from 2018. $1.8 billion in new taxes. New taxes on things like, uh, like groceries, safety apparel, like PPE. I voted against that, uh, that budget, that bill. New taxes on parking, uh, new taxes on uh, uh, soda and dry cleaning and on businesses, a $50 million annual tax increase on small businesses. We need to go in a different direction. I'm the individual that's going to push to make that happen in the 17th district. My opponent is not going to do that because he is part of the uh, status quo in Hartford. He is part of what has got us into this situation here uh, in Connecticut. We need to go a different direction, and my opponent will only support. You know, his new his new boss would be in the Senate, would be uh, Senator Martin Looney, for crying out loud. He is one of the most uh, liberal legislators we have here in Connecticut. He has repeatedly led the Senate Democrat caucus in a path of increasing the cost of living for people living here in Connecticut. So we need to go in a different direction. I think it's important that we get more conservative, financially conservative leaning legislators uh, in Hartford to understand what it means to develop and to bring businesses here in Connecticut. Thank you, Mr. Cabrera. Again, my opponent is trying to distract from the issues. Uh, the fact is I have experience getting things done, and he doesn't. Um, there, time and time again, he has not been on the side of the working men and women in the 17th district. Uh, minimum wage bill, paid family leave, um, budgets that increase school funding, voting against raises for nursing home uh, workers who take care of our seniors. You cannot attract business and you cannot support the, member, the citizens of the 17th district unless you support the people and the families of the 17th district. It's not that hard to figure out. The people have to know that their work is going to pay off. And if we focus on that, they'll have more money to do more things, which will stimulate the economy and create more businesses. Mr. Logan? Again, Mr. Cabrera continues with the half-truths. I support our nursing uh, home workers, care workers. I support our first responders. The, uh, the bill, which included the raises for home care workers, was part of the overall budget bill that I voted against. If it was a separate bill, as it was in 2018 when I supported a bill to increase um, um, salaries for uh, state health care workers that take care of people with disabilities. I voted in favor of that, right? But that was a separate bill. That particular bill for the nursing uh, and health care workers was buried in the budget that increased taxes by $1.8 billion 
dollars. Again, making Connecticut less affordable. Looking at increasing raises or artificially increasing the minimum wage, right? Increasing the cost of uh, of living for everybody here in the state of Connecticut. Uh, to me, it just doesn't uh, make sense. We need more opportunities for folks to work here in Connecticut. Next question uh, leads off with a response from Mr. Logan. In 2015, there was a proposal to pilot a publicly managed gigabyte network to improve internet service for local government and business use. Internet service providers would be able to lease space on this network and offer their services in a more competitive fashion, bringing down expenses for all subscribers. The legislation failed and no project has been tried in Connecticut. Now in 2020, business, education, and government sectors are more dependent on the internet than ever, as retail, school, and public meetings go online, and may remain partly so in the foreseeable future. But broadband internet still is not affordable for everyone. If a public-private partnership like the 2015 proposal is not the answer, what is? Yeah, so everyone, it's a great uh, question. And when you take a look at where we are here during this pandemic, but this is now five years later, the internet is of so much more importance even now than it was then. It's important for businesses, it's important for families, it's important for uh, uh, children in terms of their learning. I uh, absolutely agree that we need to do more in terms of making sure that internet uh, access is available for uh, businesses uh, throughout uh, our communities. Uh, I would uh, prefer to do that without uh, raising uh, taxes. Uh, I think we can do that by looking and prioritizing uh, how we spend uh, the available monies that we have that we are collecting currently. Uh, but I am absolutely in favor of looking at different uh, uh, proposals and looking at ways to make sure that that technology is available for all here in the state of Connecticut. It is incredibly important, and I think it's important in terms of helping to uh, improve the uh, business climate here in Connecticut. It will help towards that step of trying to attract new businesses here to Connecticut. It will help small businesses to, uh, to grow uh, here in Connecticut and be successful. I think it's vitally important. It's important for our children so that they're able to uh, learn they're able, they're able to do the research that they need. They're able to communicate as necessary uh, now in these modern times. So I am absolutely in favor of uh, listening to and hearing and uh, uh, sponsoring and recommending uh, ways and ideas for uh, making internet access uh, more available for all uh, here in Connecticut. Thank you. Mr. Cabrera. The, the digital divide is real. Um, my wife is a school principal and when the pandemic started, uh, she was on the phone a lot with parents and many of her students uh, simply didn't have access and couldn't get their assignments, couldn't get their homework done. And we spent a lot of time running around uh, trying to get them access to the internet uh, so they could do their work. Um, they had those, those gaps before the pandemic. Um, and again, it's part of a, 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 a neglect on the behalf of uh, our, our state to not tackle these issues. You know, this is about um, having equal access to education and now with this pandemic, having a Wi-Fi connection and being able to have access to the internet is even more important. Uh, whether you're working from home or your kids are going to school uh, at home, it, it's really important. It's something we need to invest in. It's good for our state. It's good policy for uh, making sure that we, all our kids get educated. And I think it's the right thing to do to make sure we fight to close that digital divide. Mr. Logan? Yes, again, I think it's uh, of vital importance, uh, and I will certainly look uh, very carefully at, at any uh, legislation uh, that will help to accomplish that. Uh, I, again, I think it's important for our small businesses. It's important, particularly now as we're in the middle of this uh, pandemic, to uh, make sure uh, that um, children in uh, all parts of our state uh, have access to the Internet so that they can properly uh, learn and properly communicate uh, with their you know, schools, with their teachers. Uh, so I will uh, continue to keep an eye out and look and help to support um, internet access uh, throughout our state in a responsible and meaningful way. Mr. Cabrera. Again, it's just, it's a very, very important issue that we um, have to focus on. You know, um, growing up as a boy, we didn't have much money and the internet was just starting. And I remember going to the computer lab in our local library um, to do my work just when the internet was taken off. It's even more about it now. There's things my kids can do that I have no idea how they do them. 
and they teach me many times. It is an integral part of everyday life now, having access to technology, having Wi-Fi, having access to the internet, and it's got to be a basic um, need that we must meet. Thank you. We have our last question of the evening, and Mr. Cabrera is going to uh, leave off with the answer. Uh, what is the best way for members of the public to give input to their legislators? Uh, through public hearings, uh, messages on their Facebook pages, written testimony, or phone calls to the legislators' offices? Which do you, would you give more attention to while in office? I think all of the above, and there's, I think all those ways you should get a hold of your legislators. Um, I love meeting with people. Um, God willing, when this pandemic is over, I want to be able to host people, and one of my plans is to make sure we, I have a space in the district, uh, preferably probably in Derby or Ansonia, maybe Naugatuck, where I can meet people on a regular basis and hear their needs and hear their concerns and be able to be on the ground and keep my pulse to the ground and not get disconnected. And uh, in addition to that, I think, you know, I believe in, that this is a, a citizen democracy, and I think citizens need to organize, uh, need to hold their elected officials accountable, and they need to uh, do all the things you just mentioned, but uh, go beyond that and, you know, go up to the Capitol and, uh, and make sure that you hold your legislators' feet to the fire when they say they're going to do something. And that's a really important function of our democracy, and that's something that I believe in deeply and something that I will be promoting uh, aggressively. Thank you. Mr. Logan. Yes, uh, I certainly uh, try to, uh, by example, just show how important it is um, and for legislators to be accessible to the folks that they represent. I have consistently, since I've been in office, uh, held regular uh, off office hours or coffee hours uh, the first Friday of, uh, of every month, I'm at the Valley. Uh, I'm at the um, um, uh, Valley Diner in um, in Derby. Uh, first, uh, as a first Friday of the month, I'm at the Three Brothers Diner in Hamden. The first Saturday of the month, I'm at the Acropolis Diner. There's so many places they're keeping track. The third Friday of the month, I'm at the Valley Diner, uh, and also I go to uh, Barbara's Diner in uh, Hamden as well. Uh, so I try to make myself available uh, personally, but I also make myself available in terms of. Uh, I give everybody my telephone number, which I'm going to do right now. So get your pens out. 203-626-1508. And I encourage folks to uh, text me, call me. Uh, I meet with folks one-on-one uh, -on -one in the local uh, community. Uh, and I encourage folks to get a hold of me and, and um, express to me their concerns by, uh, you know, by any means, whether it's uh, through social media. I have a Facebook account. Uh, Instagram account, whether it's through uh, email at my uh, uh, state uh, uh, site, um, any way to get to me, and I do my best to get back to folks as quickly as possible. I do my best to get out into the community, uh, something that uh, my uh, uh, opponent, who again, he ran in 2018, disappeared for a, a, about a year and three quarters, and now he shows up again when it's campaign season again. I am out there in the community on a regular basis meeting with folks uh, because I love the community. I love meeting with folks, and I love finding out the best ways that I can help our community here in Hartford. Mr. Cabrera. Again, Mr. Logan, you're having trouble with the facts. I did not disappear in 2018. I stayed involved. In fact, I helped elect people to office in Ansonia and Derby during, in between the elections. I helped 35,000 frontline workers at Stop and Shop win health care benefits and wage increases and the historic strike that took this in the Northeast by storm. I've been on the front lines fighting for PPE, plexiglass, hand sanitizer, and hazard pay for grocery workers in our district, in Naugatuck and in Sonia. I haven't disappeared. I've been here all along. Mr. Logan? My opponent talks about what he does for his job as a paid union steward. You know, I am talking about above and beyond my job. I, you know, I work at a water utility. Uh, I help to, uh, I've helped in, uh, over my career uh, to modify and to um, uh, 
develop and create the uh, pump stations, treatment plants, water supply plants. But that's not what we're here to talk about our job. What are we doing extra for the community? I'm on the Griffin Hospital Board of Directors. I'm on the Valley Chamber of Commerce Board of, the, uh, board of Directors. I'm on a, a, a many different, or I'm, I even, I'm even a member of the Elks Lodge in Naugatuck, the Eagles Club in, in Naugatuck, the NAACP. I am in the community on a regular basis hearing from folks. I am going above and beyond to make sure that I uh, truly represent the people in my district and I lead by example. Thank you. Thank you both for a truly spirited debate. It's been very uh, enjoyable listening to it. Uh, we're now ready uh, for the closing statement segment of our program, uh, where each candidate will have 90 seconds uh, to give a closing statement. Uh, Mr. Logan, uh, you go first. Thank you. So, you know, this campaign has been uh, replete with uh, issues brought up by my uh, opponent. Paid family medical leave. Again, he's putting out negative uh, mailers, repeatedly indicating to folks that I'm not in favor of paid family medical leave. I am in favor of paid family medical leave. I'm just not in favor of the version that passed during the, uh, the, the, the last uh, uh, session we had in 2019 that includes a pay reduction for everybody in the state of Connecticut of a half a percent beginning January 1st, except for, of course, union workers. I supported and I voted for a paid family medical leave bill that was an option that people could buy into. So I did vote in favor of paid family medical leave, but in the legislature, in the Senate, the Democrats have more uh, uh, individuals, more senators, so they have more votes, so their uh, bad version of paid family medical leave passed. Not only is that bill ir irresponsible, it's not even gonna be able to fund itself, in which case they're gonna be looking to increase, increase uh, the payroll tax or reduce the benefits that they have promised them. When it comes to uh, artificially increasing the minimum wage, I believe that that is a, a job-killing bill. And you can see it right now. Go into your local stop and shop. Go into your local shop, right? Uh, go to your local uh, uh, home improvement uh, store, and you will see less, less people working at the cash registers. You will see now automation and kiosks and automatic checkouts where they're utilizing technology because it's becoming too expensive for people, for uh, businesses to actually hire uh, workers. That is what happened with the artificial increase of the minimum wage. I want everybody's pay to increase by way of a vibrant economy and I want employers, I want employers competing for employees because the economy is going so well. Mr. Kerber. Thank you so much to the chamber and for everyone for doing this tonight. You know, I'm, I'm a working class kid. I'm a first generation college graduate. Uh, I have strong uh, family values and those are the values I've been living out for my entire life and those are the values I'm gonna take to the state senate. You've heard tonight a lot of excuses um, about why things can't happen. The fact is when you invest in people, you're investing in our economy. When you believe that people deserve a raise because they work hard every single day, you're helping the economy. Senator Logan doesn't believe that. Voted no against the minimum wage. When you put families first and invest in them so they can take time off for a newborn child or to be able to take care of a sick grandmother or grandmother, you're helping the economy, you're helping Connecticut. He voted no against that. And a couple of times he took a shot at the fact that I work for a union. I'm damn proud to work for a union. I represent over 7,000 grocery workers who have been on the front lines since this pandemic started. They have kept working through it all. And I am proud to represent them and fight for hazard pay and PPE. Senator Logan has trouble holding people accountable, including his employer, Eversource. And he voted, he took a walk on a bill that was important in 2017 that increased your utility rates by, almost, by 90, is 90% responsible for increasing utility rates. None of this is made up. You can check it out, loganforeversource.com. That's logan number four eversource.com. You cannot continue to not fight for the people in this district. That's gonna end. He should hold them accountable. He hasn't, I will. Thank you. Um, this concludes our program. I'd like to call uh, Nancy back up for a second and let her uh, make some closing remarks. Uh, and I wanted to thank her personally for uh, her stewardship of the chamber and for making sure that uh, we always have these opportunities to see uh, the people that are going to be representing us in uh, political life face-to-face, uh, -face, hopefully face-to-face -face soon, but we get to ask them the tough questions. So Nancy.
thank you again for everybody who are participating and watching live. I just want to thank everybody for participating. It was really um, interesting to watch the dialogue back and forth on Facebook Live. Um, we were happy to have an event like this. Um, it's so important to hear from our candidates and hear, and if we can't gather in a regular format, this is something that we were able to do. Um, I know it might have been confusing seeing the screen um, go back and forth, um, but we are in a situation where we are social distancing from each other, so we had to make accommodations available. My apologies for the microphone. I'm sure you're glad to see it open and ending. Um, have a good night, everyone. Thank you again.